Heavenly Father, I just thank you for what you've been teaching me, and I just ask that you would help me to share a little bit of what I've learned and what you've been how you've been changing my heart. And God, I just ask that you would use your word to speak to everyone here. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, we live in an era of entertainment and dissatisfaction. Never before in history has the world seemed so within reach. I realize that most people in this room are probably 40 or older. So if we take a trip back in time, 50-ish years ago, so maybe, it's, let's go 1961. The first transcontinental telegraph was invented. A year later, the first cassette tape hit the shelves. In 1967 was the year of the very first internet message. 40 years ago, the world found its very first personal computer blowing the crowd away with its first interactive mouse and screen. 41 years ago was the very first mobile phone call. In 1972, we had the very first video game system, the Atari. Very high tech. Yes. <laughs> All right, jumping ahead, we have the very first cloned sheep, Dolly. In 1996, in year 2000, the GPS, text messaging available for everyone in the US, the iPod in 2001, cell phone cameras, social media became mainstream when Facebook came on, on into the scene in 2007. Um, since then, there's been cell phone apps, iPads, 3D TVs, 3D printers, and even 3D pens. I think I put a picture up there. Yeah. 3D pen. You can actually draw a picture in 3D now. Um, and they say by the year 2016, there may be their first unmanned mission to Mars. Soon following will be a manned mission to Mars. And I've been told by Pastor Dan that is only a one-way trip. So that <laughs> sounds really sketchy. Anyway. So the world is changing faster than we can keep up sometimes, and this is the world that young people are born into. Kids nowadays have never lived in a time that computers didn't exist. I haven't, um, or cell phones, or even high-speed internet. <laughs> Each day we are bombarded with hundreds, yes, hundreds of advertisements, whether we like it or not. We're driving down the road, and they're on billboards, they're in the sky train, everywhere you go. And over the past 50 years, there's been such a huge shift towards youth being the focus. And now they say that 40 is the new 30. And the market aiming at teens is actually beginning to target at 11 years old, sometimes even younger. Um, and it stretches out to people in their mid to late 20s. In the world that says youth is everything and beauty is success and money brings happiness the, and one night stands make you feel complete, how do Christians of every age slug through it all and see things for what they truly are? There is truly a great divide between reality and what the media portrays. Some call it the hyper-reality, reality, this utopia where once you have everything you ever wanted, you will have this transcendent state of bliss. To the youth who have been born into the world of media, they often live with a constant state of dissatisfaction with the present. Forget the youth. I think just people in general. A steady starvation, if you will, for fulfillment, of a place for a place of contentment. It eats away at the present humdrum of life, dubbing the normal things as wrong and abnormal. With happy endings and lacks of consequence, life isn't supposed to be boring. It should always be exciting and fun. The world tells people to follow their dreams and catchphrases like you can do anything that you set your mind to or a hot sunny beach is all that you need. Behind these words is the assumption that by reaching this pinnacle of your existence, your purpose, if you will, you will attain fulfillment and happiness. Too often, people are left 
falling between the void of expectation and crashing headlong into reality. The culture we live in does not leave room for a state of having little or being without. Even to Christians, it's easy to suddenly jump to conclusions that because we don't have what we want, even when we ask, God must be withholding from us. One major theme in the Bible is God using something the world would see as negative for a positive purpose. So let's just think about it for a second. We have Joseph, enslaved, imprisoned, ends up ruling and saving his entire family. Ruth, widowed, in a land unfamiliar, unfamiliar uh, marries Boaz and becomes part of Christ's lineage. Esther, forced to marry an evil king, separated from all she knew, saves all of Israel. Moses, society reject, poor shepherd, frees Israel from slavery. Not to mention practically every prophet. They didn't live in mansions or have piles of food at their fingertips. Half the time they were homeless or hungry or surviving lions or running from people who wanted them dead. <laughs> Paul was the epitome of these things. He was beaten and jailed, starved, shipwrecked, beaten again for good measure, often homeless or poor. Not to mention he got bitten by a snake this one time, which is pretty unfortunate. And looking at life from the lenses of our culture, people would say that he is one of the most unfortunate, cast-aside individuals they'd ever heard of. We would assume that he would be sad and dejected at having a hard life, and yet he can say this. Philippians 4.12, I know, ooh, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul mentions that, we know, that he knew the secret of being content. For, um, from what I've seen growing up around Christians and my whole life, and is that too often we live in a state of discontent and sometimes even defeat. Believers can often be so unsatisfied, if not even more sometimes than unbelievers. I often wondered at how exact, exactly Paul was able to find contentment and even joy in all situations. More often than not in my life, I have let the state of not having get me down. But by looking at Paul's life, and words, I can be encouraged to see the world in a different light. Too often, we only see a bad situation from a negative perspective, a place of condemnation and rejection. By looking at Paul's life and words, how can we begin to see everything differently, even in the difficult times? So first, Paul believed that God's grace covered his life, and we need to believe that too. He had a deep acceptance of his humanity but not without the realization that humanity and its failings, when fully surrendered up to God, could be used for good. This is clear even by looking at verse 13 in Philippians 4. I can do anything through the strength given through Christ. He had a deep trust that no matter what happened, God had a greater purpose for it. Not only that, but that these things were a chance for God's power to do to be displayed further. In 2 Corinthians 12, 6 to 10, he says, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassing great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, 
in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For, where, or for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul could have complained about how he was suffering, held his weakness in contempt, but instead he accepted it all as an opportunity to reveal, for God to reveal himself further. At the root of this was his recognition of his imperfection and his faith in God's grace to fill in the gaps. Like 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I read this, but I often forget that it's actually God who is saying this to him. Jesus knew that Paul wasn't perfect, but he used these weaknesses for God's glory. Looking at the statement more closely made me realize that the key is the word grace. Why would Paul need to be reminded that God's grace was enough? There are many speculations about what the thorn in the flesh was, and sometimes I wonder if the message from Satan was condemnation of his past. I don't know. Like, it's so many things it could be. But one thing I do know is that Paul was human. Being human, he would definitely have had moments of regret. In his ministry, did he meet people who had suffered greatly because of him? Lost family members and friends. I can imagine that Paul understood his desperate need for God's grace. Not only did he know he had Jesus' grace in his life, but he believed the truth of it. Otherwise, his past would cripple him with condemnation. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It's pretty cool how connected grace and power are. The more we realize our complete dependence on God's grace, the more we step aside and allow him to work through us. When the world looks at the weakness as bad, we could see it as good. Why is it good? Because it gives God a chance to do something that's unexpected. Let's begin to see our weakness as God's opportunity to blow us away. The more we realize our limitations, the less credit we take when God wants to do something. Often, just like Paul, we ask God to take things away, but he chooses not to. Instead of becoming frustrated, maybe we ought to realize that God is actually allowing our weaknesses so we can learn to receive his grace in our life. That the fact that God would permit these weak points to remain is more about his love for us and his desire for us to trust him. Let's not look at these thorns in our flesh situations as God's indifference, but actually his love. God wants to amaze us. He wants us to trust him. What else can we learn from Paul about joy and finding contentment? Paul knew that these two things, joy and contentment, do not depend on circumstance. In fact, joy and contentment often go hand in hand with suffering. Many times that joy is referenced in the Bible, especially by Paul, it is in direct reference to trials and pain. Not that there is no joy without suffering, but more like joy and contentment happen regardless. Just take a look at the world. If fortune and privilege is what gives contentment and joy, then I wonder why it is that countries such as Canada and Korea, and America, and Holland, and Sweden, and Germany, all these developing countries are listed in the top 50 countries with the highest suicide rate. The Bible speaks about joy in many situations, not just in celebration, but also in disaster, persecution, and pain. 2 Corinthians 7.4 says, I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. 2 Corinthians 8.2 In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Hebrews 10.34 You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. James 1 verse 2 Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
It's all fine and dandy to know that joy doesn't depend on circumstance, but if we're honest, we just don't really feel joyful when bad things happen. But in saying that, why is that? People like Paul can find joy. That, that is where I feel choice comes in. Yes, though we don't like to hear it, joy and contentment are something that we must consciously choose, but not how we would expect. expect. We cannot will ourselves to have joy. Have you ever tried that? I remember one time, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. Oh well. Um, one time I was, I think in high school, and I was really like grumpy, and I remember standing in front of the mirror, and I was like, I should just try smiling and see what happens. It was like painful, right? Like it hurts to, to force that. Anyway, <laughs> what brings joy is continued relationship with God. Through this, we are given an understanding of his character. The more you learn about what grace is, or forgiveness, or dependence on God, the easier it is to reframe any situation. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. In the end, sometimes we don't even realize that we are actually the authors of our own pain. Which brings me to the last point. Suffering is the best teacher for thankfulness. So I realized, Doug's here, I shared this story with a few people, but it's a really good example of what reframing looks like. So as you all know, I, I live in a nice little cute house, and I have a certain space that requires strategic planning about what furniture I get, because it's not big, so I can't have like a giant couch or whatever. And so I was looking around, and. I, I needed a dresser, above everything I needed a dresser. And I had one that my landlords lent me, but it wasn't big enough for all my clothes. And for the longest time I didn't have one, and I was looking, but it was like, it's a little tricky when you don't have a car. And it, so it had been about, it had been quite a few months, and I was folding everything and storing it under my bed. And there was, and it was really starting to get to me, not necessarily the lack of dresser, but more like my just, lack of everything. <laughs> the past year had been really difficult. I had moved a lot, I said goodbye to so many people, and I lost my car because it was really broken down and I had to get rid of it. And just things seemed to be piling up, this list in my head, like I don't have this, and I don't have this, and I don't have this. Anyway, so when I was working, I, I think I got a text message that said, from my landlords, oh, we got you a dresser. And I was like, oh, that's really awesome. So I go into my house, and um, I was really excited because it had been like five months, and it's, yeah. <laughs> so that evening I went home, and there was a dresser that fit perfectly in my room. And I just stood there <laughs> and stared at it for a long time, <laughs> thinking, I was so thankful. I never knew I could be so thankful for something that most people don't even think about. Then I realized I never would have been that thankful if God, hadn't, if God had given it to me right away. Um, I never would have been thanking him or appreciated it. If I had gotten it even a month before that, I probably wouldn't have, I would have been like, oh, nice, a dresser. But I learned a valuable lesson that I hope I won't ever forget. Too often I see my lack in something as a sign of God removing his love when in fact it is his way of revealing it. A while back I asked God to teach me to be more thankful. <laughs> he answered me, but not in the way I expected. He allowed things in my life to be taken away so I might learn to be more thankful. I think that I misunderstood what thankfulness was for the longest time. It might sound crazy, but thankfulness, just like joy and contentment, is not dependent on a situation. We can even thank God for things that are difficult. Why? Because we have to believe that God can use anything for his glory. As my grandma liked to say, this was like 
my least favorite quote of hers, but it's so true, mostly because it kind of stung a little bit. He cares more for our character than our comfort. In Philippians 4, 4 to 7, Paul states, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in, everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we all could take daily take Paul's advice to heart, if we not only just prayed with petition, but also with thanksgiving, I think that's when God opens our eyes to his purposes. Too often as Christians, we forget to be thankful, especially for the little things, because God cares for us even in those things. That is who God is. He doesn't do everything in a grand style, and often the quietest voice speaks the loudest. But he shows up in the most simple ways. He is a God in our everyday life, in the mundane as well as the exciting. I really don't think you can have joy and contentment without thanksgiving. The reason Paul was able to find joy and contentment in the most adverse situations was because he trusted God enough to see the world from a spiritual perspective. To move forward, he had to hear from God that God's grace was enough to cover his sin. He surrendered his weaknesses and realized that through those, through those God was able to work more powerfully than any human strength could. Paul could look at a situation and believe that God, because he loves his people, was able to turn it out for good. Let's not forget that Paul wasn't a superhuman. He was just like us. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. How awesome. Let's start trusting in him more, not only to give us joy, but to see every situation as God's opportunity to work amazing things. I'm just going to finish with this piece of scripture. So I don't think I put it up, but I'm just going to read it and you guys can listen. <laughs> listen. Romans 8, 28 to 37. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, we who, oh, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.